Skype connectivity, audio signal, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing, testing, Skype connectivity, audio signal, testing, one, two, three. If you are able to hear your own voice, then you have configured. also comes through through this speaker. testing service. After the beep, please record a message. Afterwards, your message will be played back to you. Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing, testing, Microsoft, microphone, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing, testing, Microsoft. If you are able to hear your own voice, then you have configured Skype correctly. Testing, testing one, two, three, testing audio system for the Skype connectivity. Oh. Testing, testing one, two, three. Hello, 
Welcome to Skype call testing service. After the beep, please record a message. Afterwards, your message will be played back to you. Testing, testing one, two, three, testing audio system. Testing, testing one, two, three, testing audio system. If you are able to hear your own voice,
Okay, it's 9.30. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I joined co-chair Chris Smith in welcoming you uh, to this Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission hearing on the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Syria. And I expect members will come and go and, you know, that's what usually happens around here. So, uh, but I, uh, this is an important hearing. And I especially want to welcome the witnesses who are joining us today. All of them represent agencies that operate on the ground in Syria and surrounding countries and all bring a wealth of experience and knowledge. I deeply appreciate the important work that they do to save people's lives and to safeguard their well-being, often in very difficult and dangerous circumstances. I'm not sure that the contributions of humanitarian actors are as widely recognized as they should be. So let me take this opportunity to thank you on my own behalf and on behalf of this commission. However bad things are in many parts of the world, there is no doubt they would be even worse without your persistence and your commitment. Um, I wish that we didn't have to be here today. Uh, a couple of years back, this commission held a series of briefings and a hearing in an effort to draw our attention to the terrible toll of the Syrian armed conflict on the civilian population. Ours was far from the only voice. Many organizations were raising alarms about indiscriminate bombing, the destruction of civilian infrastructure, including schools, purposeful attacks on healthcare institutions and providers, mass executions, systemic sexual violence, and more. From its earliest days, the Syrian conflict has been marked by a blatant disregard for international humanitarian law, the rules of war meant to protect those caught in the crossfire. And from the beginning, that blatant disregard has been condemned in the strongest terms. The call for civilian protection has been a constant refrain. Yet here we are, eight years into the conflict, with no end in sight. According to the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, hundreds of civilians, including women and children, have been killed or injured due to airstrikes and shelling since May 1 of this year, while more than 400,000 are estimated to have fled their homes to escape the violence. Nearly 12 million people in Syria, 60% of the population, are in need of humanitarian um, and, pr and protection assistance. The numbers are simply staggering. But the Syrian conflict and its regional consequences are no longer front page news like they were a couple of years back. As the war has ground on, the reality is that attention has shifted to other crises of which there are too many. So the objectives of the hearing today are to draw new attention to the complex and immensely consequential humanitarian crisis in Syria and ask what more Congress uh, could or should be doing in response. The U.S. is already the largest donor of humanitarian assistance to, to the Syria crisis. From FY 2012 through August 9, 2019, the U.S. has allocated more than $9.6 billion to meet humanitarian needs. Now that sounds like a lot, and it is a lot, but this year's U.N. appeals for Syria and the affected region are less than 25% funded. Should we be giving more? And for what? Uh, as the crisis becomes protracted, how has or should the humanitarian response change? Are we doing enough to respond to long-term needs? Are U.S. sanctions as currently designed an obstacle to responding to long-term needs? There is the question of refugees. More than 5.6 million refugees have registered. Turkey, with a population of 80 million, has absorbed 3.6 million uh, Syrian refugees. According to news reports, the administration is considering cutting refugee emissions to the U.S. to zero next year. It's fair to ask whether we're doing our part on the refugee front. And most fundamentally, uh, what more could we be doing to protect civilians as well as humanitarian workers and to ensure humanitarian access uh, as the war continues? 
How can we help you confront the obstacles that you face? Is it important to reauthorize UN Security Council Resolution 2449 or, or of, of 2018? And what are we not doing on the diplomatic front uh, that we should be doing? You know, these are some of the questions I hope that we will discuss uh, today, and I certainly look forward to hearing from all of you. And let me just finally say that, you know, uh, it bothers me greatly that uh, there's not more focus on Syria um, here in Congress and throughout the world, given the enormity of the humanitarian crisis. Um, and it's not because the data is not before us. I mean, I just went through a whole bunch of figures where, you know, countless millions of people are being displaced and, and killed. Um, I think maybe, um, you know, we're being inundated with so many facts and figures and statistics that we've lost our human ability to feel them. Uh, and, um, you know, we have talked to many people um, who have fled the Syrian crisis um, and who are, you know, not only traumatized, but, uh, you know, who are begging the world community to do something to uh, to stop this horrific situation, uh, and so um, so we're interested in your um, perspective and your ideas, and I want to thank you all for for being here. Um, our our witnesses uh, today are uh, Germana Kador, uh, who co-founder of the Syria Relief and, De and Development, uh, which is a humanitarian organization that's provided millions of dollars worth of aid to Syria and the region. Uh, Arno. Uh, uh, Came, uh, came Am I saying that properly? I just want to make sure I'm pronouncing it for the TV cameras. Um, who serves as Syria Country Director for Mercy Corps. Uh, we have um, Anna uh, Chervi, who is the Norwegian Refugee Council's uh, Country Director in Syria. Uh, and Amanda Catanzano, uh, who is the Senior Director for International Programs, Policy and Advocacy for the International Rescue Committee. Uh, and so we are, um, you all have much more detailed biographies, which I will submit to the record, but I would rather hear you than me go through your long and uh, distinguished biographies. So uh, having said that, we'll begin with uh, uh, Germana, and um, thank you for being here, and the mic is yours. Just make sure you're all your, when you're, your mics are on when you're, okay. Thank you. Co-Chairman McGovern and Co-Chairman Smith, thank you for inviting me to testify before this panel to discuss Syria and its humanitarian crisis. I'm the co-founder of Syria Relief and Development, a Syrian-American humanitarian organization that has provided over $75 million worth of aid in Syria and the region and has assisted over 7 million beneficiaries and employs over 1,000 people inside of Syria. I want to touch on a few key issues and offer several legislative recommendations that Congress can take into consideration before taking your questions. The current scale of humanitarian devastation in Idlib and northern Hama surpasses everything we've seen in Syria so far. According to the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, since April alone, more than 1,000 civilians have been killed, 300, 300 of them have been children. Airstrikes have targeted over 40 hospitals, 29 water stations, and dozens of schools. 17 whole villages have been destroyed. In five months, more than 600,000 Syrians have been displaced. Just to put this number into perspective, that is six times more than the last displacement and the worst displacement we've seen in Syria, which was Ghouta, that displaced 80,000 civilians. No humanitarian organizations, including the United Nations, are financially or logistically prepared to absorb the devastation to come as civilians sc scramble northward. Scarce housing has quadrupled in price, costing approximately $400 a month for an apartment. Only 50% of students displaced in northwest Syria will have a chance to continue their education because more than a quarter of all schools are damaged, destroyed, or occupied by the thousands of homeless and displaced. The situation for over 3 million Syrians in Idlib is becoming more fragile by the day and may soon result in a new refugee crisis. Greece has already begun seeing an increase in the number of refugees arriving from Syria at levels not seen since 2016. The deadly escalation on the ground has directly impacted Syria relief and development's capacity to provide services. This past May, our Pulse of Life hospital in the town of Has Idlib was among those bombed and completely destroyed by the Russian military. UN OCHA was provided with the hospital's coordinates as part of its formal deconfliction mechanism with the expectation that by doing so it might be spared attack. We were wrong. Our hospital was deliberately targeted, leaving the local population of over 200,000 without medical services. 
Despite this setback, Syria Relief and Development, along with nine other Syrian American humanitarian organizations, continue to provide services in Idlib and as part of the, as part of the American Relief Coalition for Syria. Collectively, we have, we have provided more than $670 million worth of humanitarian aid to more than 48 million beneficiaries. I am proud to serve on the executive committee of that coalition. However, more assistance is needed from the United States and the international community. We must ensure that aid reaches the civilians who need it most. Access to food and medical supplies should never be used as a weapon of war, not by the Syrian government through its heavy pressure on Damascus-based organizations, or by terrorist groups like the Al-Qaeda-affiliated Hayat Tahrir al-Sham. Stabilization aid is needed to support civilians in Idlib who are pushing back against the influence of Hayat Tahrir al-Sham otherwise known as HTS. Humanitarian organizations, the only entities still receiving U.S. funding in Idlib, are not designed nor are they capable of playing this role. Most importantly, civilian protection is paramount. The United States must take demonstrative action to bring an end to the fighting as President Trump called for in September 2018. The situation unfolding in the internally displaced camp of Ruqban in southern Syria is an appalling one. More than 12,000 residents of the camp have been under siege by the Assad regime and Russia since February, with the exception of one limited recent UN aid delivery. Reports of human rights abuses for residents who return to regime-held areas needs to be properly investigated. This should start by engaging with bodies like the Syrian Association for Citizens' Dignity, who are involved in monitoring the situation. There are bipartisan steps lawmakers can do to address some of these issues. First, the United States can push for a genuine return to the Geneva peace process, a track which has all but disappeared and would ideally halt the current bombing of the civilians. Second, Congress should pass House Resolution 31, the Caesar Syria Civilian Protection Act, a crucial measure that penalizes the Assad government for crimes against humanity and imposes sanctions against individuals and entities complicit in war crimes. Third, Congress should approve the No Assistance for Assad Act, House Resolution 1706, which similarly bars reconstruction funding to regime-held areas, knowing that this aid is likely being used to rebuild loyalist areas and enrich businessmen close to the Assad regime. Fourth, it should adopt House Resolution 395, introduced by the co-chairs of Friends of a Free, Stable, and Democratic Syria Caucus, that condemns the bombing of hospitals in non-regime-held areas like my organization's hospital. And finally, to ensure that fiscal year 2020 funding levels for humanitarian and disaster accounts remain robust. Members of Congress need to urge the U.S. to bypass the siege of Ruqban by bringing in aid cross-border aid, cross as mandated under U.N. Resolution 2449 from Jordan or Iraq or from the U.S. base in a ton of pocket by airdrops. Realistically, these are the only things that will stop the people in Ruqban from starving. Thank you again for allowing me to testify on a global issue that constitutes the greatest humanitarian crisis of this century. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Kima. Um, Co-chairs McGovern and Smith and distinguished members of the Commission, thank you for the opportunity to testify about the ongoing conflict in Syria. I am grateful to the Commission for your leadership in organizing this important discussion about the humanitarian challenges facing the people uh, of Syria. I will focus my testimony today on the dire situation in northwest Syria and will conclude by sharing recommendations for the international community and US, U.S. policymakers to address this urgent crisis. Mexico has been responding to the conflict in Syria for over seven years. With the recent es escalation in the conflict uh, in Amma and, in, and Idlib, we have increased our emergency response in the northwest, reaching 130,000 people thus far. But too often, numbers don't accurately reflect the terror of this crisis. We hear about the hundreds of thousands, but our teams hear the personal stories, and I wanted to share one of these stories with you today so that you can better understand the individual impact of this conflict. Just this week, our team met a woman fleeing from the bombardment in Kanchikun, and like so many, it was a frantic and terrifying last-minute escape with her brother and four daughters to somewhere unknown with little planning and no idea of our future. This is a woman who had already lost so much. Her husband was killed by shelling two years before when he went to the market to buy juice for the family. But she, like millions of other Syrians, is resilient. 
Even during the conflict, she was able to work on the farm and provide for her daughters with her neighbor's support. Our team met her just after she had experienced yet another loss and displacement, and we supported her as best we could, but as we speak, she's with her family, all sharing one room in a community of strangers. With the little money we provide her, she told us she could buy some bread and other food for her family. This is just one of the hundreds of thousand, thousands of people impacted in just the Northwest. And we know the majority of those people, that community with these women today have been displaced multiple times, compounding what continues to be a conflict hard to comprehend. As you know, since, since April, escalating violence in Northwest Syria has threatened the safety of, and well-being of more than three million Syrians, half of whom have already been displaced from other parts of the country. The violence has left many civilians with nowhere to go to find safety. As fighting continues to intensify, innocent men, women and children are paying the price for the world's failure to manage progress towards a diplomatic solution. Against this backdrop, humanitarian actors inside Northwest Syria are risking their lives to deliver badly needed food, water and medicine to a traumatized population. According to the UN, the population of Idlib are, are reached exclusively by cross-border actors. Assistance which is made possible thanks to the adoption of UN Security Council Resolution 2165 and subsequent resolutions. Here are some of the impacts of the ongoing crisis in the Northwest. There is mass displacement. On top of the already enormous level of the displacement in Northwest, since April, over 600,000 people have been displaced once again, and dozens of villages and towns have been almost completely emptied and destroyed due to the conflict. Shelter needs are not being met. In northern Idlib, many displaced people are living out in the open with no access to shelter or services. Hospitals, civilian structures and humanitarian workers are being attacked in clear violation of international humanitarian law. According to the UN, 43 health facilities, 87 educational facilities, 29 water stations and 7 markets have all been impacted by fighting since April. Some of these facilities are being struck despite having shared their coordinates with parties to the conflict via the UN deconfliction de list. Humanitarians continue to face access constraints, <coughs> fighting, insecurity, obstruction of aid, and concerns regarding sanctioned entities present in Northwest Syria have all hindered the humanitarian response. Despite this, humanitarian workers bravely continue to respond to needs. Our team members and partners, as well as the 15,000 humanitarian workers currently working on the ground in the Northwest, continue to show up to work and provide life-saving assistance despite the most challenging circumstances imaginable. The United States and the Congress must use all of its diplomatic pressure to bring an immediate end to the suffering and fighting in Northwest Syria and to ensure the protection of civilians and access to people in need of humanitarian assistance. The United States government should one, renew the diplomatic push for a serious political solution. Two, publicly reaffirm the importance of international humanitarian law and condemn any violations of it. Three, encourage the administration to provide additional funding for humanitarian assistance efforts. Four, push for the renewal of the extremely important UN cross-border resolution. Five, support the continuation of the whole of Syria humanitarian structure. And six, ensure that the recently established UN Board of Inquiry to investigate destruction and damage to facilities on the UN's deconfliction de list and other UN-supported facilities is effective and can begin without delay. In conclusion, I wish to th sincerely thank the Commission for its focus on this important issue uh, and for extending me the privilege of testifying today. Thank you very much. And before we proceed to our next witness, let me just say there, there is a bunch of seats in the front that were reserved for the witnesses, but since they're testifying, they're free, so people don't have to stand if you'd like to take a seat. Um, we're now going to turn to Ms. Uh, Chervy, uh, who's, uh, I, think, I think we're connected. Uh, uh, we welcome your testimony. I have uh, prepared a written testimony, which I, hello? Yes. 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 Yep. I have prepared a written testimony, which I hereby submit for the record of this hearing. And I will uh, present another summary of my testimony this morning. Thank you. I would like to thank the co-chair, Congressman James McGovern, and Congressman Christopher Smith for holding this hearing on the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Syria. I join you today from Damascus, 
from where since 2015 we have provided as NRC aid to hundreds of thousands of Syrian across conflict lines into besieged and hard to reach areas and within communities affected by displacement in different parts of the country. It will be difficult in just five minutes to relate the challenges of operating in what remains one of the most complex humanitarian crises on earth, much less give justice to endless efforts that the words humanitarian aid signify in this context. 7,200,000 is the number of people in need in government controlled areas, more than the population of Norway and more than the one of the state of Washington. The biggest challenge NRC faces today is addressing the sheer magnitude of the needs at a of a very resilient and determined population in Syria, wherever it might be in the country. Our experience suggests that as areas have changed control, it has been possible for us to reach more people in need. For example, since the early days of the offensive in Eastern Ghouta in February 2018, NRC has been continuously present in that area. Nonetheless, Programming in line with humanitarian principles at scale is far from easy and risk-free in any way. Three. Three examples showing the tension between the humanitarian imperative to respond to urgent needs and our duty to uphold the other principles in practice. First, there are genuine concerns that our aid risks not reaching those for whom it is intended. This ultimately undermines the humanitarian principle of impartiality. Second, there are valid questions about the extent to which humanitarian programs out of Damascus are distinct from the influence and interest of the Syrian government or other entities, and hence truly independent while still respecting state sovereignty. Third, there are regular challenges to the ability of our assistance to do no harm, which remains at the core of our responsibility as a humanitarian organization. So how does NRC approach this complex and ever-shifting environment? Examples are choosing, for, the, for example, direct implementation of activities through our staff and being on the ground with communities every day. Similarly, in 2015, we have established clear operating principles, including non-interference in, of any third party in internal processes, such as recruitment and procurement. Further, we do advocate with decision makers when, for example, a permission is low to arrive or a visa for our staff is refused. Finally, even when we, even a time when pre-developed beneficiary lists or list of damaged community-based infrastructure are provided by authorities, it is only after a thorough damage assessment for each location and an independent need assessment that we will narrow down a list of places and choose to operate where we best meet needs and avoid doing harm. Approach the humanitarian response in this manner, however, does come with a cost. At times we fail, and it requires a lot of effort and persistence. It can result in undue delays in implementation, disruption of the and have also reverberating effects on the people we are here to serve. Working in this context takes courage, courage in speaking up, courage in serving at the forefront of a complex crisis amidst the highly constraining conditions. It requires equal courage to face assertive decision maker and negotiate the necessary space to carry out our program. However, it must be done if we want to be there to support Syrians when they need us most, contributing to preserving their dignity. All of us in this room have a role to play, even when it might feel overwhelming or too challenging. Moving forward, look to members of the House of Foreign Affairs Committee and other branches of the U.S. government to encourage all U.S.-funded partners to consider some of the approaches outlined above. Adequate, flexible and timely funding to Syria remains crucial to addressing the immediate needs of those affected by this conflict. I wish to sincerely thank the Commission for its focus on this tremendously important issue and for extending me the privilege of testifying today. I look forward to answering any of your, of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now turn to Ms. Catanzano. Chairman McGovern and Chairman Smith, thank you for holding this hearing.
thank you and the Commission for your consistent efforts to keep human rights and humanitarian issues central to U.S. foreign policy debates. And thank you to my colleagues for their insightful perspectives. I will focus on Northeast Syria, where over 600,000 have been displaced and 1.65 million depend on humanitarian assistance in the aftermath of ISIS's brutal reign and the intense fight to drive them out. The International Rescue Committee has worked in Northeast Syria since 2013. We operate in Syria as part of the cross-border humanitarian response authorized by UN Security Council Resolution 2449. Last year, thanks in part to generous U.S. government funding, IRC reached over a half a million in need in Northeast Syria, providing health care, protection, cash programming, and skills training. Much has changed in Northeast Syria in the past year, but challenges remain for civilians and for humanitarian, the humanitarian response. First, the U.S.-Turkey so-called safe zone. This initiative is a political and security arrangement. Dressing it up in humanitarian language sends dangerous signals to displaced Syrians. It risks pulling vulnerable Syrians into an area that cannot offer adequate protections or humanitarian services. Further, it risks being a pretext for Syrians, Syria's neighbors to pressure Syria refugees to return to this zone, regardless of their areas of origin. In President Erdogan's recent statements in favor of large-scale re return compound, these, compound our concerns. We welcome the U.S.'s recent switch to the more accurate term security mechanism. The U.S. should encourage its partners to drop the safe zone label and avoid misleading humanitarian references. And Congress should insist the mechanism not be used to justify involuntary or uninfor uninformed returns and that implementation does not impede humanitarian access or response. Second, uncertainty in El Hol camp. From December to March, as people fled Baguz, the camp's population swelled from 10,000 to 70,000, almost all women and children. Thousands arrived daily, including 12,000 in just a single 48-hour period. They were malnourished, in poor health, and in traumatized from the violence they witnessed and experienced. Tensions in El Hol are high, especially in the annex, a restricted area where about 10,000 foreign nationals, including 7,000 children, reside. IRC is present in El Hol. Residents and staff have expressed to us directly what fuels these tensions. First, most women are separated from their husbands and adolescent sons with no idea where they are, whether they are alive or dead. This is quite understandably their primary frustration. The camp residents have very little information about their own future. Syrians face unclear departure processes with little insight into conditions back home and foreigners face even more uncertainty as few countries have been willing to repatriate their citizens, even children. Under humanita international humanitarian law, all camp residents are entitled to humanitarian assistance, but access to water, health care, trauma treatment, and other essential services is unequal and inconsistent in all whole camp, especially in the annex, where few services are available and extreme restrictions on movement make it nearly impossible to access goods and services elsewhere in the camp. The result? Women giving birth alone in tents, mothers watching helplessly as their children die from lack of medical care. Nearly 400 children have died en route or at the camp, disproportionately inside the annex. This state of limbo meets no one's needs or interests. We urge Congress to push for sufficient resources for basic services and to prioritize trauma treatment for all camp residents. And Congress should insist local authorities provide camp residents with basic information about their status and about their separated loved ones. The administration's push on governments to repatriate their citizens also deserves congressional support. Last, beyond El Hol, hundreds of thousands of displaced Syrians across the Northeast face uncertain prospects for return and reintegration. A case study is conflict-devastated Raqqa where 40% of the housing stock is unlivable and the electric grid remains offline, opportunities for school and work are limited, health facilities are often difficult to access, in part because of the huge numbers of unexplode ordnance, landmines, and IEDs that litter the city. Despite these challenges, residents are returning. The population is up to an estimated 160,000 from a conflict low of 3,000. But the sustainability of these returns is in question because of the widespread destruction and the funding and security constraints on humanitarian action. By some estimates, 
17% of returnees displace again after only one month back in the city. These challenges play out across the Northeast. The U.S. has a special responsibility in Northeast Syria. We urge Congress to scale up funding for humanitarian assistance, especially demining efforts. And Congress should request a State Department and USAID long-term strategy to meet the needs in Northeast Syria that go beyond the emergency response and to prioritize the renewal of the UN Security Council's cross-border resolution. I offer my sincere thanks to the Commission for its enduring commitment to Syria and Syrians and for giving me the opportunity to share the uncertainty facing my IRC colleagues and our clients in the Northeast. I look forward to answering your question. Well, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you all for your testimony. Uh, and again, uh, let me again thank you as well for the incredible work that all the organizations that you work for uh, do in very, very dangerous situations. I, I want to now yield to the uh, co-chair of the commission, uh, Mr. Smith, for <coughs> any comments? Or uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would ask that my full statement be made a part objection. of the record and just make a few points um, and thank our witnesses as well for their they're very, very valuable insights for the work that they're doing on the front line uh, and with their co-workers and their co-leaders in the region. Uh, you know, back in, uh, in, in uh, Ms. Quador, is that my saying that right, Kurt? You rightfully call for Congress to pay, pass H.R. 31, uh, the Caesar Syrian Civilian Protection Act, and, and I remember some of the hearings that uh, the chairman of the, um, uh, Ed Royce had chaired uh, where what was revealed by Caesar was, was beyond words um, uh, barbaric, uh, and Assad is directly responsible for that. You know, in 2013, uh, I actually chaired uh, two hearings, introduced a resolution, H Conrad 51, which passed the House, uh, calling for the establishment of a hybrid court. I mean, the ICC might be able to do this, but it's not likely that they have not stepped up in a way that, that has made a difference. Uh, we had David Crane testify, who was the special prosecutor, uh, the chief prosecutor for the Sierra Leone uh, um, Tribunal. Uh, he's the one, his group, that put um, uh, the president of Liberia behind bars for 50 years and many, many others who had committed uh, outrageous atrocities. And, and the point being that hybrid courts, uh, whether it be Yugoslavia, Rwanda, or uh, Sierra Leone, while not perfect, uh, provide a way of getting real buy-in, um, the, the prospects of not losing evidence, and people, as you've all pointed out, in those camps have been so traumatized, and they carry with them testimony that could put individuals uh, and, at the very top, the worst of the worst, behind bars, hopefully, for the rest of their lives. So um, I have not given up on it. I actually wrote an op-ed for the um, Washington Post, which they published. Uh, but there seems to be this idea that, well, Russia would never go along with it. Well, they went along with the Yugoslavian tribunal, even though uh, Milosevic was their, their client and their friend and their ally. Uh, but because it was applied to all those who commit atrocities, uh, they acquiesced and did not block it. So there's still some hope because without justice, the humanitarian peace uh, is very severely impaired. So, but I, so I want to thank you for again bringing attention to this ongoing need. Um, Ms. Um, uh, Servi, uh, you pointed out, and I just would ask you to speak to it, all of you, uh, scale up funding for humanitarian assistance. What do we need to be at? Uh, what is the gap you know, in real dollars uh, that has not been uh, achieved to try to mitigate this crisis? Secondly, ensure U.S. funding is not used for humanitarian responses or IDP re returns where they are not fully cleared of ERWs, landmines, and IEDs. Um, have there been incidents where uh, people, families, others been killed because inadequately, you know, dealing with the, the, the threat uh, and, and the emplacement of those kinds of things like, like landmines? Thank you, Congressman. I can take the, um, the IED and ERW question. Um, yes, absolutely. I think Raqqa is, is um, sort of ground zero um, for that kind of contamination. Um, and we've, we've seen numbers of over 600 civilians who've been killed um, just living their everyday lives. Um, the contamination is extensive, and it, 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 it's from both unexploded ordinances from coalition bombing, but also from you know, ISIS-determined efforts to leave destruction in its wake in terms of landmines and IEDs. And so this is, is a constant challenge for us moving around the city, both for civilians and humanitarians, very difficult. I think I mentioned healthcare facilities None were functioning in Raqqa um, at the end of the conflict. 
Um, there are now um, healthcare facilities in every neighborhood, but as I mentioned in my statement, um, it's very difficult for families to access them um, for a host of reasons, but not least because of, of this widespread, almost omnipresent contamination. And when you say insure, is it not being done? Are there, you know, are there shortfalls in? There are in, efforts. The they are not concerted or systematic enough. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to, break, to highlight two areas of funding that we could um, look at. So the stabilization fundings that have been on hold. Um, you know, we were told that I think allies of ours in the region were going to cover some of the 200 million, um, but unfortunately, none of that money is being considered to be for distribution in northwestern Syria, which, as I highlighted in my testimony, is very problematic because then you're putting an undue burden on humanitarian organizations to work in the space of civil society, which we are not designed to do. We were not created for that purpose. We are not able to do, you know, sort of the pushback on HTS's any, in, you know, attempts to intervene in humanitarian work, et cetera. So I think going back and considering that 200 million, the stabilization funding, but making sure that it is distributed in the Northwest as well as the Northeast is very important. And the second issue is education funding, because education, unfortunately, is not seen as emergency aid. It is considered stabilization aid. Um, and I think we're very much in an emergency situation given there are some kids in Syria who have never attended school, given how long this conflict has carried on. So I would absolutely say, I can get back to you on exact numbers for the sure. record, sure. Um, but education funding really needs to be s seriously considered. By now, USAID and, and the U.S. government would argue that they have been very robust in their funding. They do try to... Absolutely. Uh, it's just that money is not going for education. Gotcha. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Let me go back and, and I think, Ms. Chervy, I think some of the... Com uh, questions were directed toward you, so I'll sure. give you an uh, opportunity to respond. I don't know whether we, we might have lost connection. Hello? Yes. Did you, did, uh, uh, yeah. Congressman? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, maybe uh, from uh, from this perspective, what I would say is that when it comes to gaps, so what can be done that has not yet been done? Um, I'd like to go back to what I shared earlier, like the sheer magnitude of the needs that we have in front of us, uh, developed in many different trajectories. On the one hand, there is ongoing conflict in many parts of the country, and on the other, there is protracted displacement in many other parts of the country. And unfortunately, the environment is such whereby to deliver on both accounts is not equally um, easy, and uh, it has different constraints. There are investments that need to be done on longer-term humanitarian programming that uh, is uh, sensed with uh, diffidence from uh, so from donors, because it might bring also our political connot connotation to that. There are also programs that need to have factored in local counterparts, governmental counterparts to happen, and that is also problematic. It's problematic in many different ways. And therefore, when it comes to gaps, gaps come from provision of services. Many of the persons that are now living in areas that have changed control, maybe from uh, since one year, is, uh, Guta is uh, one example, but also the south of the country, have not been able to, ac to access regularly basic services such as education, water, electricity, and so on and so forth. What are we going to do collectively about that? And this is a question that we keep asking ourselves as humanitarian responders here, and uh, that we keep asking those that have supported us throughout the years to do the incredible job that we have done across the, this conflict. Thank you. Just uh, one final question, uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you. Um, I think it's important to address the ISIS domination of the Al Hall. A camp, and maybe our witnesses would like to speak to that. There was a, a Washington Post article on September 3rd, uh, which I would ask you, Amos, can be included in the record? Um, and it, it was uh, the content of the article uh, tells how a 14 year old Azerbaijani girl who had simply suggested not wearing a, a niqab uh, was brutally slain, and how a pregnant Indonesian woman was murdered for simply talking to Western journalists. Um, that camp. Uh, houses people from countries so far afield, shows how, f uh, you know, ISIS domination there inside the camp. We know, and I've been in camps all over Africa, um, sometimes what happens inside the camp is as much of a threat to people as what happens outside the camp. Uh, so I, I would appreciate your thoughts on, on that security situation uh, and how that might be rectified so that those um, internally displaced persons uh, are not maltreated. 
Uh, thank you for asking this question. This, um, this article was indeed very uh, stern and very dark in the way it described the situation in the camp. Um, there are a couple of things that could be done immediately, and that starts with uh, establishing uh, robust systems to deliver basic services, um, because uh, people not receiving uh, daily uh, whatever they need in terms of uh, food, uh, education, and uh, health is definitely increasing tensions for them and a sense of uh, being abandoned there. Uh, but there's another part which is very related to uh, their uh, current status, um, coming from the last uh, area controlled by ISIS, which is the lack of perspective for them. Uh, as my colleague from IRC explained, uh, most of them have very little clarity on what their future can be and what would be the process for them to be released from that camp, which um, increased the sense of um, uh, when, when you don't have any uh, clear path toward uh, returning to a normal way of life, uh, you cannot expect people to not uh, uh, consider the most radical uh, way to, to behave. I'm happy to follow up, thank you. Um, I, um, I think there are several things that can be done. Um, I don't think that we should be naive about what is happening in the camp, but I also think we need to be nuanced about what's driving and fueling those tensions, or at least a great deal of it. Um, in addition to what my colleague from Mercy Corps um, mentioned, um, and what I mentioned also in, in my written and oral testimony is, is, is the uncertain, to this uncertainty that he referenced also around the future um, and whether or not their adolescent sons are alive or dead, whether their husbands are alive or dead. Uh, this is a, the primary driver of frustration and violence in the camp as told to us by residents um, while we're working there. And you can, you can understand that. That is an understandable frustration to have. Um, it's both the lack of access to basic services, but it's also the inconsistent and unequal access to those services. Um, when there is no market inside the annex where the foreign nationals reside, when there is no 24-hour health care, but it is so difficult for them to get the necessary permissions and arrangements to leave the annex to access those services elsewhere, you can imagine that is a source of frustration and a source of danger, as I mentioned. This is a situation where women are going into labor in tents alone at night, or their children are dying. There was a newborn last month that died right after childbirth from complications that could have been dealt with, but there was no 24-hour medical care within the annex. So I think we have to be clear-eyed about both the, la the uncertainty about their future, the lack of services, what that means to their mind state, and also the lack of trauma care. Many of these women and children were victims of ISIS, and they have not had access to the mental health services that they need to, um, to, to bring them out of that darkness. Um, and in the small um, instances where we have been able to provide that support, we've seen rapid drops in aggression, particularly among young boys who were playing beheading games and, and you know, fastening things into weapons. When they were able to have child-friendly spaces, when they were able to get some trauma support, those games quickly transformed into much more normal childhood activities. So I do think if that can be scaled up and made consistent, we will see um, a drop in aggressive behavior. And, and if you combine that with more information about loved ones, more information about their own future and the prospects for return and reintegration, that will have a tremendous impact on the level of tension and violence. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just want to get a, 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 ask a couple of questions just for the record because I think it's important. Uh, so could you explain what the humanitarian principle, principles of neutrality, impartiality, and independence are and why they are important? Any of you or all of you who are Uh, thank you. Um, so these principles exist to make sure that uh, humanitarian aid is uh, delivered not based on people's belonging to a party of a conflict, uh, to a specific ethnic uh, group or a religious one. Uh, and so neutrality, impartiality uh, are all uh, principles that are uh, there to, um, to ensure that we are not associated with any of the uh, origins or causes of the crisis we are usually uh, dealing with. Um, it, it's, it has been extremely useful in contexts like the northwest uh, of Syria, where uh, arriving in a context where, where groups that are designated as terrorist organizations are uh, seemingly uh, controlling uh, the, the ins and outs of, uh, of the situation. We can uh, explain uh, how these principles are going to apply in terms of us 
choosing people based on a, a vulnerability and not uh, based on their appartenance to a group, uh, as well as operating in a way that will not be uh, influenced by their own uh, agenda as a political or a military group. Uh, and uh, fortunately, in the context of the Northwest, we've managed to maintain this principle unilater unilaterally uh, in a way that was uh, sometimes uh, in re requiring negotiations, but ultimately uh, allowing us a, a fairly good uh, level of access uh, to the people in need. And, and you all basically agree with that? Or anything you want to add? I'll, I'll just add, yeah. I, would, I would absolutely echo um, Arnaud's comments, uh, specifically in the Northwest. Uh, we have been able to operate all of our medical centers, our facilities, without any intervention by any of the armed parties. Um, they, they do not touch our facilities. They do neither have the financial capability or the expertise to run any of our facilities. Um, but because of these principles, over eight years, we have been able to really keep them at bay and continue our work. And for the record, could you explain the criteria you should determine if those displaced may return safely to their places of origin? Returns to places of origin should be voluntary. They need to be informed. They need to be um, sustainable. And um, that, uh, those are the, the main criteria. Um, I think when I talked about the so-called safe zone earlier, one of the concerns we had about that is raising false expectations about the level of services or the level of protection in an area that could be the basis of an uninformed return for a Syrian refugee or a displaced Syrian, that that return could be based on false information or misleading information. So being informed, being voluntary, being sustainable. And everybody agrees with that, right? Okay. Um, and what, what more could the U.S. civilian and military departments and agencies be doing to demonstrate their commitment to international humanitarian law in Syria? I mean, I think um, specifically on the refugee front, I actually just returned from a summer of in Turkey and Lebanon last night. Um, and, and I was there when a lot of these refugee, you know, some attempts to return refugees back to unsafe Idlib and other parts of Syria was happening um, both out of Lebanon and out of Turkey. Um, and I think uh, one of the most important things the United States can do is um, to work with our regional partners, both uh, and in this case being especially Turkey and um, Lebanon to offset the, um, the, the severe pressure they have on their, on their budgets and on their refugee intake systems to be able to properly um, facilitate a decent way of life for the refugees living in those countries. It is, in our opinion, and I think in many other NGOs' opinion, it is not safe to return Syrians back to Syria at this time. And so whatever we can do to help support them in the regional countries is absolutely paramount. Um, and that involves working with our civil society, um, you know, uh, allies and partners in those countries as well as the governments themselves and making sure they have the funding they need to Thank ensure you. that. As far as uh, international humanitarian law is concerned, um, the US government can do three things, I believe. Um, the first one, of course, is to respect it. Um, the second one is to um, advocate for it, to uh, be vocal about the importance of respecting this order. We know how hard it is to uh, uh, create, uh, let alone ensure, the um, implementation of international norms. Uh, and any time uh, uh, a country like uh, the US uh, reaffirms its importance, uh, it helps uh, the other, uh, other uh, actors on the ground to, to follow them. And the third thing is to ensure that whenever a violation happens, it is clearly uh, denounced and investigated, and that those who did that are held accountable. Um, there's nothing humanitarians love to talk about more than IHL, so I think you've opened up a can of worms. Um, I'd like to echo everything my, my colleagues said, but also, and, 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 and really underscore, condemning all attacks when they happen um, loudly um, in the Security Council and elsewhere and demanding that accountability. There is an opportunity right now um, for the United States to, to push hard on the UN Secretary General for a board of inquiry that he announced in August into um, attacks in Northwest Syria. Um, it's, this could be an opportunity that shouldn't be squandered and the US should be pushing the Secretary General to make sure this, is, this board of inquiry is put together rapidly, that it is independent, that it is um, staffed with IHL experts and that the findings are made public. 
Um, and then I think um, going back again to the safe zone, ensuring that that zone cannot be used as a pretext for um, premature and involuntary return. And I think there are also symbolic efforts um, the U.S. government can and should take both around the level of humanitarian assistance to those in the region that are bearing the burden of this refugee crisis um, and also as you said, Chairman McGovern, early, doing our part right. when it comes to resettling refugees in the United States. Ms. Chervi, I, um, I, I don't know if you have anything to add, but uh, if you do, this is, uh, we, we yield to you. Yes, um, maybe I'd like uh, to talk to for a second on the human influence and then to touch upon the issue of safe return, which are topics that are particularly important for the response uh, at our end. Uh, I would like to um, add uh, another element uh, in terms of a humanitarian principle, that is the one of humanity. And this is where it's extremely important that we remember that our mandate as humanitarians is actually to everyone humanly and to be there at the time of their most, and to be able to save lives as well as support people to overcome the impact of the crisis ensuring that the kids respect of their condition, and we do so in a dignified way. This is at the core of what, where the, the, our work generates. Then, moving on to other principles that I think are very important, especially for the uh, context where, um, of the organization based in Damascus. I think the neutrality is another of the humanitarian principles that needs particular attention. We, as humanitarians, do not take sides. And it doesn't matter if we need to talk to a number of stakeholders that are parts of the conflict to be able to get to the people that we need to assist. That doesn't mean that because we talk and interact with them, we are taking sides with them. It, it does mean that we need to engage in order to be able to have a safe space within which to deliver the humanitarian aid that those people need the most. When it comes to impartiality, impartiality is equally important, and it talks about non-discrimination. Non-discrimination of people regardless of where, we, where they are or where they end up going due to the forced displacement generated by violent conflict. And it is very important to remember that when uh, territories change control in an active conflict, people are most likely not choosing as of whether they end up living. And we should not discriminate them because they live on the wrong side of the conflict lines. And finally, I would like to talk for a second about independence, which is also part of my testimony, where basically implementing independently is extremely challenging in any, in any context where humanitarian workers perform, because we are normally in a state, and uh, whether it's a state that is fully functioning or non fully functioning, we are subject to the laws and regulations of that very state. Because we are respecting those regulations, this doesn't mean that we are not independent and we are actually delivering our needs. Then, moving on to the issue of safe returns, which is particularly important in the context where we are operating here, it's about it being voluntary, it's about it, about it being informed, and it's about it happening to the place of where people choose to actually return to and without restrictions imposed on them. Now, this is where I think as, uh, as the people that have at the core of their interest Syria, it's very important to create a space to be able to actually dialogue on what return means, and most importantly, what durable solutions for people in Syria mean. Return is just one of the options that people have to actually find a longer-term solution to their displacement, and we should also include those others, such as local integration or resettlement. This is particularly important for um, IDPs as well as refugees that still are in displacement at some point or another will need to actually have a durable solution. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I'll yield to uh, my colleague, uh, Representative Omar, if she has any comments or questions. I will be brief. I know we um, have to go back to the committee. First, I just want to um, express my gratitude to the co-chairs for um, continuing to have this conversation and, and uh, doing this hearing. Um, the world sometimes feels like it's become numb to what's happening in Syria, and we hear from a lot of people who are asking us um, 
ways that we can keep the conversation going. And I just want to thank all of you for being here with us and, um, and engaging in, in this conversation. Uh, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about some of the challenges that the humanitarian organizations are um, dealing with. Uh, I know that in regards to some of our counterterrorism um, laws, sometimes they could be preventive in the work that you're uh, trying to do. Um, I remember when I was in Somalia in 2011, when the famine was happening, um, this was particularly a problem. And <laughs> it is my understanding that President Obama issued a guidance promising that there wouldn't be persecution for the humanitarian organizations in regards to um, being seen as providing material support or, or such. Um, but there are worries, um, obviously, when it comes to the current administration that we have uh, in not being able to follow some of the norms um, and guarantees that what would have previously been in place. Um, and I know at the time that the co-chairs of this commission in did introduce a bill um, to address this, but unfortunately it wasn't uh, signed into law. Uh, we, pre we obviously need to keep material support laws on the books, but I know that people um, like all of you who are doing the uh, crucial humanitarian work have experienced some chilling effects because of the fear of persecution. Um, so I wanted to ask um, Arnan, maybe if you can um, tell us what, what are some of the effects that the counterterrorism laws that we have would um, have on, on the work that you're doing, uh, and if there were some ex um, except exemptions that we could make, what could they look like? Thank you. That's a very important question for us, as you can imagine, because um, implementing it in the northwest of Syria is one of the most challenging in terms of compliance I've been ever worked on. Um, we, we appreciated that the administration has done its utmost to uh, ensure that there was a path towards implementation for us instead of coming with a blanket, no, it's too complicated. And this was definitely not a given a year or a year and a half ago uh, when the discussion around the license to operate in that part was open. So we felt that we had a very strong ally uh, uh, within USAID uh, pushing to open uh, and unpack the various parameters that uh, could be uh, put on, on the humanitarian actors in, in, in light of the counterterrorism uh, um, uh, restrictions. Um, I think if anything can be done moving for further, I think that's exactly uh, what needs to continue, to not uh, come up with a very simple uh, blanket answer to these very complicated situations, but to try to understand each and every element that can be played with so that we can find ways to practically implement. Um, this has been, in some contexts, extremely difficult, and uh, we recognize that in some places it was eventually impossible for us to work. I'm um, thinking a couple of years ago when ISIS took over a big chunk of the northern part of Syria, uh, with or without counterterrorism uh, regime, we would have to um, we had to uh, cease activities somewhere because we realized that we could not implement according to our own principles. Um, but in a place where this prerequisite is met, uh, I think the conversation should be going on as long as possible, as long as the needs are extremely high. Uh, so um, this is something that it needs to be constantly informing all these discussions on counterterrorism. Mm -hmm. Did you all had anything else? I think I echo everything that um, my colleague has said. Um, I, I think we do want to acknowledge the OFAC license in Northwest Syria coming online relatively quickly. I think the humanitarian community did breathe a collective sigh of relief um, when that came into play. I think um, looking at ways to um, prevent us from needing one in the first place or for something that is a more general or more of global OFAC license um, um, so that we're not going back to the well each time um, in each individual geography where we work um, would be something to consider. And Ms. Jervy, I don't know if you have anything to add to the uh, comments that have been made. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> All right. 
Um, well, I obviously one of the most um, pressing humanitarian crises coming out of um, Syria in the last eight years has been the migrant uh, crisis. UNHCR says they have registered 5.6 million Syrians as refugees outside of Syria. They estimate another 6.2 Syrians who have been um, internally displaced. And as you know very well, their neighboring countries, um, and you've stated today, their neighboring countries have taken on vast majority of the burden of the refugee crisis. Turkey has taken in 3.6 million refugees from Syria. Lebanon has almost a million. Uh, Jordan has more than 600,000. Um, the burden often falls on many of the neighboring countries when there is a crisis in a particular country. Um, we know that these countries are stretched in capacity, as you've stated. Um, while many of the members of our current uh, president's team are proposing that the United States, which has wealth and space um, to accommodate hundreds of thousands of refugees, should cut admission to zero. So I often wonder how we can expect small countries like Lebanon um, to do a better job in, in resettlement um, when we are not able to um, say that we will do the same thing. Um, you know, in, in, in many of my conversations when it comes to um, immigration in, in this country, I, I talk a lot about how we seem to be losing the moral high ground in, um, in pushing people. So my question, to all of you is um, from your perspective as people who have been on the front lines of providing service to refugees, what should our part look like? Um, what kind of leverages do we have uh, in this very historical moment with this particular administration? Um, and how can we be doing better in providing support uh, to those neighboring countries that are bearing the, the burden? Um, what does it look like for, for us to call on the world to do its part when there is a um, migrant crisis like this? Um, thank you for your question. Um, I, would, I would highlight a couple of things. First, I do think that on behalf of the Syrian American community, we were very grateful that the temporary protected status was approved very recently by the administration. Mm -hmm. That was absolutely critical um, and helped about more than 6,000 Syrians be able to remain in the, in the United States and not have to go and find somewhere else to live. Um, now, many of them, you also have thousands now that their cases are pending in terms of asylum cases pending, legitimate cases of asylum um, that, are, that are connected also to work permits, et cetera. And so if the administration um, and, and Congress can do something to push along those legitimate cases of asylum of people that are already here, are already trying to contribute to this country, have fled legitimate um, unsafe conditions to help them remain here safely. Uh, in terms of uh, our partners and allies abroad, wherever they may be, um, I believe it was recently some of the Scandinavian countries, and I'm not remembering which one of them, um, but there were two that were actually considering removing the unsafe conditions from or looking at Syria as an unsafe place to return thereby opening the door for possible refoulement back into Syria. And this is very, very concerning for um, Syrians who may now be in Europe and, and in other places to see you know, some of the most progressive European allies you know, view Syria as a safe place, which many, many reports by a variety of different governments and INGOs show otherwise. In terms of, of, the, of the region, as I said, um, I've spent two months right now in, in, in the region looking at sort of the refugee parts of the crisis, and I think, um, first of all, pushing our allies in the region not to, I mean, applying real leverage, real U.S. push to make sure that they do not um, forcibly return or um, allow, for example, the burning of refugee camps that was happening in Lebanon, it was well documented, um, or, uh, you know, uh, making sure that their work permits are renewed for Syrians that are registering, that are trying to have lawful presence in those neighboring countries, making sure that those governments, um, so long as people are there lawfully, that they um, are allowed opportunity to stay there um, and not be forced back into conditions that, that very much show that they would be detained, tortured, and possibly killed if returned back into Syria. 
Uh, so really, the the the, the crisis, you know, the really. Um, the crux of this lies on working closer with uh, civil society organizations that are in those countries. There's many who are willing and able to work with us, and obviously the governments themselves. Thanks. In addition to working in Syria and its neighboring countries, the IRC resettles refugees in 26 countries across the United States. So we see the full arc of the crisis, um, from the conflict inside Syria to the country of first refuge, along migration routes into Greece and Serbia, and then as refugees are resettled across the US. Um, I think from the perspective of the IRC, we cannot stress enough both the humanitarian imperative around a robust US refugee resettlement program, but also its political and diplomatic value in terms of how it speaks to our allies and partners who, as we have um, noted today, are bearing and will continue to bear the burden of, of millions of Syrians that they are absorbing. I think it is a substantive contributions to the lives who, that are changed and often saved as they resettle and rebuild their lives in the United States, but it is also of, of just tremendous symbolic value. The narrative that we can send assistance and take care of the problem over there so we don't have to worry about it here is a false one because countries and their leaders take note of what we say and what we do. I think that we really do need to see the, the ripple effects that going to zero or going to some other low number will have. Um, and I would urge Congress to um, make their support for the refugee resettlement heard loudly, particularly in the coming days. Um, I appreciate that. And I, and I think, you know, really when um, we, we lose sight of right our um, our, our place as as leaders um, in in the world, then then we um, lose the leverage to to be able to um, create that that more perfect world that we are all after. I recently had a conversation with. Um, Kenyans uh, in in the parliament about the crisis um, that would ensue if they returned Somalis forcefully returned Somalis into um, Somalia and um, and and what it looks like for for them to um, to stop people from coming into the country and one of them laughed and said it's fascinating that you are a member of the United States Congress, um, and when your own country um, refuses to allow people in, into its borders, forcefully is removing people from its country, that you feel like you have a right to tell us what we should be doing. Um, and I think it is really important for us to recognize the kind of um, vulnerabilities that people are, are facing as they live in these refugee camps. Um, and uh, just a simple return, um, which to, to many people, right, in, in, in the United States makes sense, right, to say, it's safer, why wouldn't you just return? This is home. Um, and to many people who are living in refugee camps five years, six years, 10 years, 20 years. They've lost their home. They don't, they don't recognize any more neighbors. Their neighbors might have been the ones that have attempted to kill them. Um, so the idea of returning to that same place um, is, is one that um, is um, just horrific. Um, and, and I just hope that um, my colleagues and, and, and many of the people who are listening and watching um, can can understand what what it means to be in that place of extreme fear, um, to know you know the, the the kind of horror that you feel when um, your own has turned on you, uh, and and the idea of uh, creating a safer place um, to to go back to is is one um, that you are desperately uh, seeking. Um, thank you all for, for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Before I convening. yield to Mr. Smith, I, I think Ms. Chervy wanted to comment, so I'll we'll try to see whether we could hook up. Yeah, um, I would like to thank for the extremely important question and really uh, for the contribution to the feedback so supported by other colleagues in the room.
uh, Syrians, uh, I don't think, will wait for us to move on with their lives. And when I say Syrians, I mean Syrians, regardless of which label it's on them, whether are IDPs or are communities, or are simply Syrians displaced without any label attached to them. While we did decide what to do, they will need to decide whether they want to go back home, even if it's not at the standards that they would like to see for themselves in their future. They will need to decide where to enroll their children next year in their schools. They will need to decide whether to repair their houses or not. And we have a collective responsibility to decide whether to be there and accompany their journey while they actually may take those decisions. While we will need to decide whether we want to ensure that while they take that decision, they live in dignified conditions. And I think neighboring countries have shown great generosity to, uh, to the Syrian population in displacement. However, lack of valid legal stay in countries of asylum remains a serious, a serious problem for many refugees across the region. They continue to be unable to move free and subject, to be subjected to far few refugee taxes, unlawful evictions, or forced relocation. These are all issues that can be addressed with a dialogue with the hosting countries, acknowledging that, yes, a lot has been done, but yet a lot else needs to be done. I would also like to add that many of the people that we support uh, from, uh, from out of Damascus that choose to actually move on with their life over and over again come forward to us and do not ask to depend on us for the rest of their life. They ask us dignity, they ask us job, they, they ask us livelihood opportunities to stand on their own feet and keep taking those informed decisions that will shape their future and of their family. And this is where to support them, we need to be supported also with early recovery funding, for example. Lastly, I think it's very important also that we continue, like as an international community, to uh, ensure uh, the need, that the need for international protection is upheld and the respect for the principle of non refoulement is up in the conversation at all times. And when this actually is breached, there are consequences to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to yield to Mr. Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, Ms. Quadaro, if you could tell us how imminent you believe and under what uh, factual basis those two countries, and if you could provide, at least for the record, what two countries they are, uh, considering or deeming Syria to be safe enough for return. Um, hopefully they're listening to all players, especially the NGO community is on the ground. Um, that would be, I think, a major, major problem. And secondly, uh, mention was made about how uh, encouraged or grateful uh, some of you are that USAID does really have a commitment here and I think it bears pointing out that the administrator Mark Green and I meet with him frequently uh, particularly about these issues uh, is very very personally committed and uh, knowledgeable uh, about the situation so um, you know I think we have a friend and a true ally uh, in administrator Green. I'll happily submit those uh, those two to the record as soon as we're done. Um, I, I think we're I think all of us are incredibly grateful to the great uh, the work and the uh, the staff that uh, of USAID that's worked together on us with this since 2011. Absolutely, they've been committed to um, addressing the crisis at every level. Um, and I think sometimes because of the way funding is divided. They would like to do certain things that are allocated to different um, funding pockets. Like I said, education, although we've spoken to USAID about education funding, certain elements of that funding that doesn't go to UNICEF comes and is part of stabilization funding that has now been put on hold, as I mentioned. And so I think just trying to constantly work with USAID on, on where you know, where we might be able to pull funding from um, and reallocate and sort of move things around. And then obviously just making sure you all in Congress just keep that, that money coming so that we can, we can distribute it appropriately and properly. Well, as you know, I, I was the prime author of the Iraq and Syria uh, Emergency Refugee Protection Act, which was signed by President Trump. And what we found, and I had about a dozen hearings uh, during the previous administration because large swaths of people, particularly the Christians who made their way into Erbil, were absolutely ignored. Uh, the money was not getting to them by way of UNICEF and others. Uh, despite, uh, I went to one IDB camp in Erbil with 6,000 almost all women and children 
uh, and we were totally non-present there. It was 10 minutes away from the Consul General's office, uh, and they had not even been there to do an assessment until they knew I was coming and asking those questions. So that has been largely rectified, but I think we need to, in a bipartisan way, continue saying, you know, no matter who you are, you need help. We have to be there to be uh, as generous as humanly possible. So again, I thank you all for your work, uh, and uh, now you're back. Thank you very much. Uh, so we've just been informed that we're about to have votes, so um, I, I want to give everybody an opportunity to add for the record anything that we neglected to ask. But before I do that, let me, let me just say that, um, I mean, what's happening in Syria and what's happening to those who are fleeing Syria is, is so tragic. I mean, it's beyond words. And what is particularly sad is the fact that um, the world, um, you know, condemns what is happening and you know expresses their outrage over what is happening. We do do some good stuff. We USAID is doing some good stuff, but yet um, it, it, it there doesn't seem to be an end in sight. Um, and the longer this goes on, I mean, the more countries who have absorbed some of the refugees are going to be you know, feel pressure from within to, to require people to leave or to, to, or to become a, an unhospitable place for many of these, um, many of these people fleeing violence. And, you know, I, I, I mean, we, you know, I mean, I, the, the world needs to figure out a way, a, a better way to deal with conflicts like this. Um, and we certainly need to find a way to better provide protection for people who are fleeing conflicts. Living in a refugee camp for year after year after year, people being born in refugee camps and knowing nothing else, that, that's not a solution. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, it creates other challenges. Uh, and, um, and I do think that um, the United States needs to do a better job in terms of accepting refugees. Um, you know, we are a big, we are a wealthy country. Uh, we, are, we are a country of immigrants. We have a large Syrian American population in the United States. I have a, a, a large Syrian uh, uh, American population in Worcester, Massachusetts, where I live. Uh, people certainly want to be welcoming and want to be helpful. Um, and, um, you know, and part of the problem is that we're, we're dealing with our own internal politics here, uh, which basically make it more difficult for us to provide the humanitarian relief that I think is required. Uh, we need to find ways to change that. But um, in any event, um, you know, one of the reasons why we're doing this hearing is we, I, I, don't, I don't want people here, I think all of us, before all of us, we don't, we don't want people to get so weary o over this endless, seemingly endless conflict in Syria to not focus more of our attention and resources on providing the humanitarian relief to those who are caught in the middle. So um, I will offer you this opportunity to say whatever you want uh, and anything that uh, you think is important for the record. Um, and, um, and again, we thank you for being here. So uh, Ms. Kadarwa, we will begin with you. Thank you all really for your time and for, for hearing us out. I, um, you know, I just, I, the last thing I want to emphasize is I don't think anyone ever thought in 2011 that Syria, we would still be talking about Syria almost 10 years later, and that the conflict in Syria would cause such global and regional instability, the aftermath of which we are still dealing with um, on every front, as you mentioned, uh, Congressman McGovern, um, whether it has to do with refugees, um, it has to do with uh, you know the economies of regional states, um, you know, with our own national security issues. These are all you know, rippling effects of what happened in Syria, and sadly, it's not just going to disappear. Um, we do, and we do, as the United States, we have a really important role to play um, and, and in, in seeing this conflict um, through. The, the regional allies can't do it alone, our European allies can't do it alone, and U.S. leadership is absolutely necessary on the humanitarian front, although I do consider that a Band-Aid, but really the most important thing is taking leadership on the diplomatic front to bring this conflict to an end. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Mr. Uh, Kamar. I would just um, echo the, the point of my colleague from uh, Syria Relief and Development about the time. Um, this has taken a long time, and we don't see any uh, easy way out anytime soon. And I would hope that the policymakers uh, are able to be patient and to not rush towards uh, easy and fast solutions when what is required is a long-term and reliable commitment to uh, credible solutions. Is Ms. Chervy, do you want to have any closing remarks? 
I would like uh, to thank uh, for the opportunity to actually contributing to this uh, very important mm -hmm. dialogue. And, uh, and actually, I would like uh, to encourage um, dialogue to happen because, as we all uh, heard today, uh, the complexities of the ongoing humanitarian crisis will require different uh, parties to actually come together and find solutions, not for us, but for the people that are in Syria and outside Syria. I think of particular importance is going to be to understand as we move forward that as humanitarians we are caught in the midst of different interests. We are caught in the midst of violence often times and we are caught in the midst of extremely complicated situations. Where in front of us we have hundreds of thousands of people that want to move on and want to stand on their own feet and have ownership of their, of their lives and yet the dynamics of the war are not enabling them to do so. And if there is anything that can be done to actually move forward and find solutions to these tensions and to these conflicts, this is where, as humanitarians, we want to strongly advocate for solutions to be found. To enable us to reach people in need, but most importantly, to enable people to find their own future. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Cadizano. Thank you. Um, the risk of being repetitive, humanitarians um, can treat the symptoms, but this is a conflict-driven crisis, and there's been a deficit of accountability, and there's been a deficit of diplomacy. Um, I think the U.S. has a strong role to play to address both of these deficits um, and, and retake the center of gravity of the diplomatic process away from the Astana process that has never and will never put international humanitarian law or for civilian protection at its center and to re-energize a multilateral process that does put Syrians at the center and finally end this conflict. Thank you. Well, thank you all very, very much. We appreciate it. And again, uh, we appreciate the work that you do. Um, and, um, and we certainly want to be wind at your back in terms of dealing with the humanitarian challenges. But I think we all agree with you that we, we, we need to find a way to end this. Um, and the world community has a moral obligation to focus on this. And, uh, and so I, um, I appreciate your being here, and uh, thank you very much. And this hearing has come to a close. Thank you.